so long a letter by Mariama Bardiere said to continue chapter 14 alone at last, able to give free rein to my surprise, and to gauge my distress. Ah, yes, I forgot to ask for my rival's name, so that I might give a human form to my pain. My question was soon answered. Acquaintances from Grand Darkar came rushing to my house, bringing the various details of the ceremony. Some of them did so out of true friendship for me, others were spiteful and jealous of the promotion Binatu's mother would gain from the marriage. I don't understand. They did not understand either the entrance of Modu, a personality, into this extremely poor family. Binatu, a child the same age as my daughter Darba, promoted to the rank of my co-wife, whom I must face up to. Shy Bina too. The old man who bought her the new off the peg dresses to replace the old faded ones was none other than Modu. She had innocently confided her secrets to her rival's daughter, because she thought that this dream, sprung from a brain growing old, would never become reality. She had told everything. The villa, the monthly allowance the offer of a future trip to Mecca for her parents. She thought she was stronger than the man she was dealing with. She did not know Modu's strong will, his tenacity before an obstacle, the pride he invests in winning, the resistance that inspires new attempts at each failure. Darba was furious, her pride wounded. She repeated all the nicknames Binatu had given her father. Old man, Hot belly, sugar daddy. The person who gave her life had been daily ridiculed, and he accepted it. An overwhelming anger raged inside Darba. She knew that her best friend was sincere in what she said. But what can a child do, faced with a furious mother shouting about her hunger and her thirst to live? Bina too, like many others, was a lamb slaughtered on the altar of affluence. Darba's anger increased as she analyzed the situation. Break with him, mother. Send this man away. He has respected neither you nor me. Do what Auntie Asa too did. Break with him. Tell me you will break with him. I can't see you fighting over a man with a girl my age. I told myself what every betrayed woman says. If Modu was milk, it was I who had had all the cream. The rest, well, nothing but water with a vague smell of milk. But the final decision lay with me. With Modu absent all night, was he already consummating his marriage? The solitude that lends counsel enabled me to grasp the problem. Leave start again at zero, after living twenty-five years with one man, after having born twelve children. Did I have enough energy, to bear alone the weight of this responsibility, which was both moral and material? Leave. Draw a clean line through the past. Turn over a page on which not everything was bright, certainly, but at least all was clear. What would now be recorded there would hold no love, confidence, grandeur or hope. I had never known the sordid side of marriage. Don't get to know it. Run from it. When one begins to forgive, there is an avalanche of faults that comes crashing down, and the only thing that remains is to forgive again, to keep on forgiving. Leave. Escape from betrayal. Sleep without asking myself any questions, without straining my ear at the slightest noise, waiting for a husband I share. I counted the abandoned or divorced women of my generation whom I knew. I knew a few whose remaining beauty had been able to capture a worthy man, a man who added fine bearing to a good situation, and who was considered better, a hundred times better than his predecessor. The misery that was the lot of these women, was rolled back with the invasion of the new happiness, that changed their lives, filled out their cheeks, brightened their eyes. 
I knew others who had lost all hope of renewal, and whom loneliness had very quickly laid underground. The play of destiny remains impenetrable. The quarries that a female neighbor throws on a fan in front of me do not fill me with optimism, neither when they remain face upwards, showing the black hollow that signifies laughter, nor when the grouping of their white backs seems to say that the man in the double trousers is coming towards me, the promise of wealth. The only thing that separates you from them, man and wealth, is the arms of two white and red cola nuts, adds Farmata, my neighbor. She insists. There is a saying that discord here may be luck elsewhere. Why are you afraid to make the break? A woman is like a ball. Once a ball is thrown, no one can predict where it will bounce. You have no control over where it rolls, and even less over who gets it. Often it is grabbed by an unexpected hand. Instead of listening to the reasoning of my neighbor, a great woman who dreams of the generous tips you to the go-between, I looked at myself in the mirror. My eyes took in the mirror's eloquence. I had lost my slim figure, as well as ease, and quickness of movement. My stomach protruded from beneath the wrapper, that hid the calves developed by the impressive number of kilometers walked since the beginning of my existence. Suckling her robbed my breasts of their own firmness. I could not delude myself. Youth was deserting my body. Whereas a woman draws from the passing years the force of her devotion, despite the aging of her companion, a man, on the other hand, restricts his field of tenderness. His egoistic eye looks over his partner's shoulder. He compares what he had with what he no longer has, what he has with what he could have. I had heard of too many misfortunes, not to understand my own. There was your own case, Asa too, the cases of many other women, despised, relegated, or exchanged, who were abandoned like a worn-out or outdated bamboo. To overcome distress when it sits upon you demands strong will. When one thinks that with each passing second one's life is shortened, one must profit intensely from this second. It is the sum of all the lost or harvested seconds that makes for a wasted or a successful life. Brace oneself to check despair and get it into proportion. A nervous breakdown waits around the corner for anyone who lets himself wallow in bitterness. Little by little, it takes over your whole being. Oh, nervous breakdown. Doctors speak of it in a detached ironical way, emphasizing that the vital organs are in no way disturbed. You are lucky, if they don't tell you that you are wasting their time with the ever-growing list of your illnesses your head, throat, chest, heart, liver that no x-ray can confirm. And yet what atrocious suffering is caused by nervous breakdowns. And I think of Jacqueline, who suffered from one. Jacqueline, the Ivorian, had disobeyed her Protestant parents, and had married Sam Burdick. A contemporary of Mordobies, a doctor like him, who, on leaving the African School of Medicine and Pharmacy, was posted to Abidjan. Jacqueline often came round to see us, since her husband often visited our household. Coming to Senegal, she found herself in a new world, a world with different reactions, temperament, and mentality from that in which she had grown up. In addition, her husband's relatives always the relatives were cool towards her, because she refused to adopt the Muslim religion, and went instead to the Protestant church every Sunday. A black African, she should have been able to fit without difficulty into a black African society, Senegal and the Ivory Coast both having experienced the same colonial power. But Africa is diverse divided. The same country can change its character and outlook several times over, from north to south, or from east to west. 
Jaco Lin truly wanted to become Senegalese, but the mock checked all desire in her to cooperate. People called her Nak, and she finally understood the meaning of this nickname that revolted her so. Her husband, making up for lost time, spent his time chasing slender Senegalese women, as he would say with appreciation, and did not bother to hide his adventures, respecting neither his wife nor his children. His lack of precautions brought to Jaco Lin's knowledge the irrefutable proof of his misconduct. Love Notes Checks tubs bearing the names of the payees, bills from restaurants, and for hotel rooms. Jacqueline cried. Samba Dyak lived it up. Jacqueline lost weight. Samba Dyak was still living fast. Jacqueline complained of a disturbing lump in her chest, under her left breast. She said she had the impression that a sharp point had pierced her there and was cutting through her flesh right to her very bones. She fretted. Mordor listened to her heart. Nothing wrong there, he would say. He prescribed some tranquilizers. Eagerly, Jacqueline took the tablets, tortured by the insidious pain. The bottle empty, she noticed that the lump remained in the same place. She continued to feel the pain just as acutely as ever. She consulted a doctor from her own country, who ordered an electrocardiogram and various blood tests. Nothing to be learned from the electric reading of the heart, nothing abnormal found in the blood. He too prescribed tranquilizers, big, effervescent tablets that could not allay poor Jacqueline's distress. She thought of her parents, of their refusal to consent to her marriage. She wrote them a pathetic letter, in which she begged for their forgiveness. They sent their sincere blessing, but could do nothing to lighten the strange weight in her chest. Asterisk 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 Jacqueline was taken to Fan Hospital on the road to Auerkham, near the university, where medical students do their internship, as they do at the Aristide Ledantic Hospital. This hospital did not exist at the time Mordo B.A., and Sam Bodiak studied at the School of Medicine and Pharmacy. It has many departments, housed either in separate buildings or in a join. In ones to facilitate communication. These buildings, despite their number and size, do not manage to fill up the hospital's vast grounds. On entering it, Jacko Lynn thought of those gone mad confined inside. It was necessary to explain to her that the mad ones were in psychiatric care, and that here they were called the mentally sick, and in any case, were not violent, the violent ones being confined in the psychiatric hospital at the Arroyo. Jacqueline was in a neurology ward, and those of us who went to visit her learned that the hospital also had departments for treating tuberculosis and infectious diseases. Jacqueline lay prostrate in her bed. Her beautiful but neglected black hair, through which no comb had been run ever, since she began consulting doctor after doctor, formed shaggy tufts on her head. When the scarf protecting it slipped out of place, it would uncover the coating of a mixture of roots that we poured on her, for we tried everything to draw this sister out of her private hell. And it was your mother, Asa too, who went to consult the native medicine men for us, and brought back Sapha from her visits, and directions for the sacrifices you quickly carried out. Jacqueline's thoughts turned to death. She waited for it, frightened and tormented, her hand on her chest where the tenacious, invisible lump foiled all the ruses, scoffed maliciously at all the tranquilizers. Jaco Lin's roommate was a French technical cooperation teacher of literature, posted to the Lycée Fade Hub in St. Louis. The only thing she knew of St. Louis, she said, was a bridge that spanned the river. A soft road, an affliction as sudden as it was violent 
had prevented her from taking up her duties and had brought her here, where she was waiting to be repatriated. I observed her often. Old, for her unmarried status. Thin, angular even, without any charm. Her studies must have been her only form of recreation during her youth. Sour-tempered, she must have put off any passionate advances. It was perhaps her loneliness that had made her seek for a change. A teaching post in Seneca must have corresponded to her dreams of escape. She had come therefore, but all her frustrated dreams, all her disappointed hopes, all her crushed revolt connived to attack her throat, protected by a navy blue scarf with white dots, which contrasted with the paleness of her chest. The medication with which her throat was painted gave a bluish tint to her thin lips, pinched over their misery. She had big, luminous, blue eyes, the only light, the only point of beauty, the only heavenly grace in her ungracious face. She tapped against her throat, Jacqueline tapped against her chest. We would laugh at their ways especially when the patient from the next room came to chat, as she said, and would uncover her back for the refreshing caress of the air conditioner. She suffered from sudden flushes, which burned her terribly at this spot. Strange and varied manifestations of neurovegetative dystonia. Doctors, beware, especially if you are neurologists or psychiatrists. Often, the pains you are told of have their roots in moral torment. Vexations suffered and constant frustrations. These are what accumulate somewhere in the body and choke it. Jacqueline, who enjoyed life, bravely endured blood test after blood test. Another electrocardiogram, another X-ray of the lungs. An electroencephalogram was carried out which revealed traces of her suffering. It then became necessary to do a gaseous electroencephalography. This is extremely painful, always entailing a lumbar puncture. That day, Jacqueline remained confined to bed, looking more pitiful and haggard than ever before. Samba Dyak was kind, and touched by his wife's breakdown. One fine day, after a month of treatment, Intravenous injections and tranquilizers, after a month of investigations, during which her French neighbor had returned to her country, the doctor who was head of the neurology department asked to see Jacqueline. She found in front of her a man whom maturity, and the nobility of his job, had made even more attractive, a man who had not been hardened by constant dealing with the most deplorable of miseries that of mental alienation, with his sharp eyes, accustomed to judging. He looked into those of Jacqueline, in order to discover in her soul the source of the distress disrupting her organism. In a soft, reassuring voice, which in itself was bound to this overstrung being, he explained, Madam Dyack, I assure you, that there is nothing at all wrong with your head. The X-rays have shown nothing. And neither have the blood tests. The problem is that you are depressed, that is, not happy. You wish the conditions of life were different from what they are in reality, and this is what is torturing you. Moreover, you had your babies too soon after each other. The body loses its vital juices, which haven't had the time to be replaced. In short, there is nothing endangering your life. You must react, go out, give yourself reason for living. Take courage. Slowly, you will overcome. We will give you a series of shock treatments with cure to relax you. You can leave afterwards. The doctor punctuated his words by nodding his head and smiling convincingly, giving Jacqueline much hope. Reanimated. She related the discussion to us, and confided that she had left the interview already half-cured. 
She knew the heart of her illness, and would fight against it. She was morally uplifted. She had come a long way, had Jacqueline. Why did I recall this friend's ordeal? Was it because of its happy ending, merely to delay the formulation of the choice I had made, a choice that my reason rejected, but that accorded with the immense tenderness I felt towards Modu Fall? Yes. I was well aware of where the right solution lay, the dignified solution. And, to my family's great surprise, unanimously disapproved of by my children, who were under Darba's influence, one chose to remain. Modu and Mordu were surprised, could not understand, forewarned, you, my friend, did not try to dissuade me respectful of my new choice of life. I cried every day. From then on, my life changed. I had prepared myself for equal sharing, according to the precepts of Islam concerning polygamic life. I was left with empty hands. My children, who disagreed with my decision, sulked. In opposition to me, they represented a majority I had to respect. You have not finished suffering, predicted Dabba. I lived in a vacuum, and Modu avoided me. Attempts by friends and family to bring him back to the fold proved futile. One of the new couple's neighbors explained to me that the child would go all a quiver each time Modu said my name or showed any desire to see his children. He never came again. His newfound happiness gradually swallowed up his memory of us. He forgot about us.